Okay, time to talk Olympic news, and I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Ireland and Donegal Olympian Brendan Bosch. Brendan, it's good to see you. Welcome back to Highland once again. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, listen, Brendan, since the last time we spoke, a lot has happened. I suppose, first of all, family life. You had a couple of new additions. Congratulations. Yeah, we had uh, twins in, back in February, so a boy and a girl. So it's been a, a, a different few months uh, that I would have normally had leading up to an Olympic Games. But um, no, it's sure. Um, different life now and different motivation. So it's... Uh, you take the good and the and the bad together. So, uh, do you find it uh, sorry, do you find it difficult at times to juggle the family life and the, and the training, given that you you basically are a professional athlete? <clears throat> yeah, I guess the biggest thing is the the recovery and the sleep. Um, so I'd be getting at the minute I'm sleeping in a in a different room in the house to my wife, and the kids are in a different room as a kid. So sometimes I can get a knock on the door if things are getting too wild at night. Yeah. Just for uh, tag me in if the two of them are going bananas at the same time, yeah. but uh, it? normally it doesn't happen too often. Yes, the joys of life, so does Brendan. Yeah. The joys of life. Uh, well, listen, you're heading to your third uh, Olympic Games. Um, you're the first athlete to qualify from Ireland for for Japan 2020, and obviously it was it was delayed. And that we all knew you were going because you had hit the the standard quite a long time ago. It was made official when when the team was released. The first part of the team was released this week, and it was a lovely touch by you to to mention your your old leader and your old comrade down there at at, at Mulford, Hugo Dugan, Brendan. Yeah, I mean, without without Hugo, there would have probably been no athletics in Milford at all when I was growing up, and I think he came in. Actually, the club I think was set up the year I was born, so it kind of worked out really well for me. So. Um, and then obviously my older brothers were involved in uh, Manus was an All Ireland champion in sprints, and so I started out uh, with the sprints as well. But Hugo was so versatile; like you know, I'd I'd go and do long jump, high jumps, um, and then when I came and started doing race walks, he went away and learned how to do a bit of coaching with, with race walking. So he brought the knowledge back to me in Milford. I didn't have to go looking for it. Um, so yeah, like he was just such a big athletics person and. You know, and the fact that he was a world champion as well just made made it seem more possible for us as athletes to really achieve high. And um, I know I met him back in uh, September, just before he passed away. And you know, I went in and he was so delighted that I'd called in to see him after being away for so long. And you know, he was like, you know, you deserve it more than anyone to go to the Olympic Games. You've always been dedicated athlete and you know there was always kind words and he always made sure athletes had the best of everything so no without without Hugo like I probably wouldn't have been doing athletics at all yeah but he'd be very 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 proud to be watching down as, as you head to to Japan and, and to Olympic Games for for a third time so how have you managed the delay to the Olympics because you got your spot and then everything was put back and hold and put back and put back how have you and obviously Rob managed to, to deal with the whole COVID situation and, and try and keep yourself at, at such a level that you will be competitive come Japan, Brendan? Yeah, I guess the, the initial kind of news, I guess, back in March, April last year, um, there was a lot of confusion. So we decided, you know, we'll until it's officially cancelled, we just have to keep preparing. So um, and even when it got cancelled, then we were like, you know, we still need to hit certain standards throughout 2020. So we decided I I ended up doing a marathon time trial on my own in, in May. So I did a, a 308 marathon just by myself in an industrial estate in May. So that was a good sign that the fitness was still there. And then I managed to get in a race then in September when things looked like they were calming down. So I went to Lithuania in September, managed to get in a 20K. And then we kind of finished the season then, and then we started back up again in November. So um, I, I had a pretty normal season, I would say, like last year, despite the fact that we didn't actually have competition. So I, I still trained at a very high level last year, and we still hit a lot of the goals that we wanted to hit for 2020. And then obviously leading into 2021 and obviously, and then back in December, I did a PB over 30K. So you know, it's it's still been a progression of, of years, so 19 to 20 to 21, like I, I feel like I've still been able to stay on it and, and keep progressing over the two years. So 
maybe it would be nice to have it last year, but I don't think it's gonna be too negative to have it another year later for me. Um, but yeah, it's probably probably the fact that no one will be there will be a bigger factor than the fact that it was delayed by a year. Yeah, was it very disappointing that you weren't able to carry that direct form from the World Championships where you finished sixth and into the Olympic year? I, it was, I guess, in a, in a way, because it was such a, a big a big thing for me at the time to you know, to finish sixth in the World Championships and then to have that momentum push through, because you know, it would have been, I guess it was late September, the World Championships, and then obviously it was going to be um, August for the Olympics. So it was only a nine-month or a ten-month turnaround. So it was going to be a short window to, you know, to have a break and come back. But I was really, really motivated. I felt like, you know, all the planning we'd done for the couple of years before that were were just getting in, setting into place, and then the next thing it's all gone. So we did have to readjust things and um I think especially with Rob being there as a mentor and, and just being very, very clinical with how we approached twenty twenty, even though everything was cancelled. Um, it really helped. Um so yeah, look, I'm I feel like I'm in a good position at the minute. So I'll head away on a training camp now on Sunday. For a month, and I'll know more than when I get when I get that training done. Yeah, I know you were away in training camps before, and you were you were living like a caveman at one stage. You were in caves and high altitude and all sorts of things. Is is that part of the plan now in the coming weeks? Is it again? Yeah, yeah, I'm going back to the south of Spain to go up to the mountains, and I'll be back living in a cave again. So, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, uh, the caves are actually better because they're cooler. You don't need air conditioning, so sometimes you can that can affect your um, breathing and stuff if you're in air conditioning it all day, every day for a month. So we, I prefer to live in the cave and uh, cook away and <laughs> do everything for myself. We, we go back to caveman life. How many years have you have you done that? How often have you gone back to Spain? Yeah, Spain was, is probably the, the main camp. Um, we did one or two years. We went to Morocco as well. Um, which is very good. Like I probably was considering it doing it this year, but just with the the COVID restrictions, I didn't think traveling outside of Europe would have been a, a good idea. So we, we're sticking with Spain, and then we'll fly back to Ireland and then go straight to Japan. So um, yeah, trying to keep it as simple as possible. Yeah. How would you compare yourself as an athlete now, Brendan, to what you were when you were preparing for your first Olympics in, in twenty twelve in London? Jeez, it's it's very much chalk and cheese. Uh, like London for me was, I guess, London for me was a was such a massive bonus because I I hadn't even done any big championships before that. Like I went straight in at Olympic level. Like I didn't do a world champs or a European champs or anything. So it, it was very much uh, like thrown into the deep end. And obviously, after London is when I moved down to Cork to train with Rob. Um, so I should have been you know, on this massive high from going to the Olympic Games to training with Rob. And he was just like, you need to do this, 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 this to improve. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was it was probably good in a way that I, I wasn't going to rest on uh, on my laurels at that stage. And Rob really took me to another level again. So and it's obviously even 2013 to now, like it's a lot of years of, of progress in between. Um, but yeah, I feel like I'm in a good, really good position now, and and then obviously Rob is retired, so all of his energy is is going into my training at the minute. Yeah. Are you? Do you feel that you're in, in a better place, fitness wise, mentally, going into this games than you were in any of the years and at any of the competitions you competed on? Yeah, I guess maybe outside of Doha, um, like Doha was probably the the one big competition where I actually went in there with a the mindset that I was going to be one of the top finishers. Um, and I get everything up to that was kind of just learning, learning my event, learning how to race. Um, I didn't really have any pressure um, with, with other championships. Um, um, yeah. So Doha was probably really the first time I'd gone into a big, big championship with kind of in, even just internal motivation and pressure, because I don't think a lot of people from the outside really were expecting it. So, but with Rob and the way we trained that summer, like we just knew something big was going to happen. So um, I'm glad we were able to do that once. And now I can, you know, justify 
that again a second time going into an Olympic Games. So yeah, my mentality is definitely um, that I'll be going there to to compete for the top top positions. Like you know, if I'm outside the top eight in in Japan now, it's going to be a bad a bad result. Like so, it's a big difference between London, where I was absolutely delighted to be top thirty. Like so, yeah, yeah you have to develop as a sport. Like if you're happy with thirty every year, like there's no point competing. It's going to take a massive effort, a huge effort, is it, to get inside that top eight? Yeah, like fifty k is probably like it's a weird event because like there's so there's so many different factors, and I mean if you if you look on paper, there's probably up to twenty guys who probably fancy their chances of winning the medal. Whereas in other events like the hundred meters, there's probably like six six people you would bank on to win a medal. Whereas there's so much can happen in a fifty k. You know, if you can prepare right, if you can deliver your result on the day, you know, you know, have a race plan that fits the conditions of the race. You know, it's four, it's almost four hours. So like there's such a long time for you to even mentally get inside your own head and mess up a race or really like, so I feel like I'm coming from a position where I need other people to crumble. And then for me to come through in the last part of the race, um, so yeah, like any anything can happen in a fifty k. You know, a lot of people say that in all their events, but like there's no guarantees with the uh, with fifty k. Like Yo- Johan was world champion, world record holder, and he didn't even finish in Doha. Like so, um, so like yeah, a medal is achievable then for you. Yeah, I de- I definitely think, especially like the tough the tougher the race. So, so that's why I think Doha suited me. Like it really leveled the playing field like everyone was going to be struggling with the conditions and i think if it's going to be tough again in in uh in sapporo in japan then you know i feel like i'm i'm prepared to hurt more than anyone else and just get through whatever it takes like you know so yeah if it was perfect conditions if it was 14 degrees in um somewhere in europe in may like i wouldn't have, i wouldn't have a chance but in a championship race in the heat in Japan, like anything can happen. And I feel like I'm I'm prepared more mentally to win a slow race than anyone else. So <laughs> bring it on, I think. Yeah. And was the, was the move of a venue to the city 700 miles north of, of where the game's hub, is, is that a good move in your eyes? Is, is that a good move for you that uh, if you are going to go top eight or even medal, that that's the perfect venue for it? Um, I I probably would have preferred Tokyo because that's going to be even harder. Like so, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Initially, when they when they announced that it was going to be a change of venue to the north, I wasn't too happy about it. Um, but now that there won't be crowds or atmosphere, even in Tokyo, like it kind of, you know, I felt like not being in Tokyo would have taken away from the Olympic experience. But it looks like no one's going to get that now. So the fact that it's in Sapporo maybe won't make too much of a difference now. Yeah. What is it drives you for, for all of this, Brendan? Because we have athletes who competed 100 metres, 200 metres, even 800 and 400, and they put in a massive amount of effort. Uh, you're a guy that has competed uh, very early in your career at 50 Ks, which is a, a huge under undertaking. But you might maybe give us an understanding as what is it drives you to, to do this endurance event? I, I just feel like... I just want to get better and better at this one event like and over over the years I've I've always managed to like increase my performance every year so when it comes to building or looking at a new season I'm like yeah I'm still getting better I can still do more um and you know that's that's a massive motivation especially after coming sixth in the world championships to think that you're actually not even at your really the peak of your performance so like and the olympics is just you know who who doesn't want to compete at that level? Like, yeah. you know, I'd I'd do another two or three Olympics if the body holds up. Yeah. Uh, how many more years do you think the body has uh, for all this uh, endurance events that, that you compete in, Brendan? Um. Yeah. It could it could be a lot of years. Like, there's um in my in the fifty k now in in Japan there's there's a, a Spanish guy and he's like fifty one years old and he's going to be the oldest. Uh, track Olympian in history, and he was only um, two places behind me in Doha. So he was eighth in the World Championships at the age of like forty nine. 
So <laughs> these old guys keep me going as well. Yeah, but unfortunately, I, I feel young. I feel young at thirty-five. Like <laughs> I'm up against these nearly fifty-year-olds. Like, yeah, I don't feel but, like I'm the I'm the young fella coming through. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, it looks like there mightn't be a fifty k in Paris in the following Olympics. Is that is that correct? And yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I might have to change event if I want to do another Olympic Games. <laughs> so yeah, they're they're going to cut the fifty k, and uh, looks like. It'll probably just be 20k. So, I mean, for me to qualify over 20k would be massive. Like I've never qualified for 20k in any any major championship. So, it would definitely be a huge change in my mentality, mindset. You know, to to go back down in distance and try and get faster at my age. Like so. Um, but we 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 still have a 35k event um at the World Championships next year. So I'll definitely keep going for at least one more year yeah so me and you were to talk now in a number of months time towards the end of of august and um where would you like to be sitting in life um after an olympic games in japan brandon yeah i mean like the a podium is not like it's not fantasy like you know um like i i trained with rob in 2013 and i saw exactly what it, it took to win an, a world championship and you know it's it would surprise you how how it's just down to consistency like he does like rob's training there's nothing special there there's nothing there's no one day where you're like geez this fella's the best ever like you yeah. know it's just like you no know, eight months of just consistency just banging out the training like so if i can if i can finish out this final block and the training is done then you can step on the start line and you can think in the back of your head if today is my day like I just need to go get it. Like so, yeah. Especially with in my event, like you know, um, if you if you perform, if you get your result, like there's always a chance. Yeah. Well, listen, we hope that day comes for you on at the start of uh, August uh, in, in Tokyo, and you'll be a very proud man if it happens. The county will be very proud of you. I'm sure Master Hugo Dugan will be looking down on you as well, and he would be a very proud man too. Brendan Boyce, delighted to talk to you, and we wish you all the best in the upcoming Olympics. Thanks very much.